<laughs> Hello, good evening, welcome. And those cheers, folks, are for you lot. We see you. We see you there in the chat, all being nice to each other. <laughs> How dare you? Uh, great to see you. Uh, yeah. As ever, seems yeah. like a long time. Uh, yeah, Michael here in Warwickshire and... No, uh, Rupert Dunn here in the south of France. Rupert, you've um, just been telling me about your sunset. Oh, do you know, it just, it's just it been the most beautiful evening. And uh, it was one of those golden hour uh, times, just the light on the hillsides, just, oh, yummy. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I love it. My nearest neighbour's a quarter of a mile away. What what more paradise could you want, really? Ah, uh, uh, sigh. Um, yeah, anyway, sigh. before we get going with uh, tonight's uh, lovely bunch of questions, a uh, fascinating a bunch of questions too, um, thanks to mm. folks that had uh, posted them. Um, what else have we got to talk about to, tonight? Well, I, I think I think we Just should kick off. Uh, probably, in in all cheers. fairness to everybody, cheers, uh, yeah, cheers. Um, in all fairness to everybody, we should probably point out that um, <laughs> excuse me while I turn my phone off um, uh, that we're getting a lot of questions now, and uh, and so we we have to just pick questions out. Um, that we know we'll have time to cover and that we haven't covered before. Sometimes there might be questions that, you know, maybe we've kind of touched on them before and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't be upset if your question doesn't uh, doesn't crop up, but um, mm -hmm. we're kind of round it, rounding it to um, 10 per show because that way we know that we'll get them in, um, you know, in, in our normal time <laughs> as opposed to, because I, I think we had 25 or more questions come in this time. And it's just, you know, we thought if we did them all, we'd be here till midnight. Oh, but you um, don't mind that, would you? And <laughs> <laughs> I think our brains That's... might uh, start to petering out there. So uh, that was it. Yeah, we we'll, we we'll yeah. do our best, but uh, yeah. But thank Hello. you for sending them in. I mean, we love the questions. We really do. It's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. That as ever, it tests us, you know, and expands our horizons because we, uh, we you know, we don't contain it all between our ears. We, we have to run away and do a bit of uh, digging around to be able to get. Um, you know, to be able to answer your questions. Uh, hello, Lynn from down the road in Banbury. Yes, it is a bit soggy around here at the moment. Is it not? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, glad to see you all. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody uh, got to make it into megalithomania um, uh, over the weekend. Um, our talk went uh, pretty well, we think. Um, hopefully, we'll ask you. We'll ask you, who's... Uh, um, who would have the last word on this, see if we can share with you inside um, Patreon, as most of you here are Patreon supporters, uh, inside Patreon, the uh, talk that we gave, because it was was recorded and uh, it seemed to go, go down quite well over there. We enjoyed doing it, even though it took all of last week to get it together. But I think uh, only fair seeing as uh, it took us away from other duties, it would be nice if you lot got to uh, see it. It's an hour's worth talk, and it's the ten times that our minds were blown, have been blown in the past year or so. We gave you a sort of brief... Um, uh, overview, um, but uh, we'd be nice we, if we, we, we gave our patrons a, a brief overview. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so for those of you here who aren't patrons, then no, you won't have got the overview. Um, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, for, uh, yeah, we 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 did, we pulled together, um, it was quite tricky actually to choose the, to choose the the top ten, wasn't it? Because there have been so yeah. many amazing things have have come out in the last. Yeah, yeah. But we came, long, uh, yeah. We, yeah, we came up with a broad range. And while we're talking about Patreon, of course, you know, there are how many? Well, oh, there's eighty four folk out there. Not all of you can be Patreon folks. So if you wonder what we're talking about, um, hop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the prehistory guys. Um, uh, b because, um, uh, yeah, it's our Patreon folk that uh, help us do what we do and uh, keep us churning um, stuff.
stuff uh, out about prehistory and prehistoric archaeology. You, you pay our wages. <laughs> absolutely, uh, absolutely, they do. So if you think we deserve your support, um, ha go over and have a look. There's, um, um, yeah, there'll be a link in the description down below, and uh, in the uh, recorded uh, version of this, there'll be a. <laughs> yes, eventually I got it right. Um, and the other, <laughs> and the other thing, of course, that is uh, going on. Our thoughts are turning towards what we're going to do with um, standing with stones too, and lots of you ask questions uh, about that. And mm. uh, of course, you'll be the first to know as we step towards um, uh, development of of that and our thoughts and uh, you know what we're going to do and where we're going to film and that kind of thing. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be boring and uh, use the phrase watch this space. Um, Indeed, we've got some uh, some wonderful ingredients already. We just don't know which route we're going to take. And that's a metaphorical mm. route. I don't mean uh, traveling A yeah. to B route. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm. Uh, oh, should we just mention Tomb of the Eagles in passing? Just, uh, yes, uh, because yes, we do have a some a little bit of inside information on that. If um, people, are yeah, it's uh, the sad news that well, some of you will know. Uh, I don't know how many of you will know, but uh, the Tomb of the Eagles announced a couple of days ago that sadly they are closing uh, permanently. Um, it's desperately sad for Orkney. Um, uh, and well, and anybody who would be visiting, uh, basically, uh, Kathleen and Frida have just well, you know, I mean, they wouldn't mind me saying, you know, they're both well past retirement age, and it's just it's too much to manage, basically, and they haven't got family members who could step in and uh, and take it over. So they're they're going to be having talks with people like Historic Environment Scotland and what have you to uh, to talk about uh, maintaining public access. But at the moment, what w might happen with the museum and all that kind of stuff is, um, uh, is very much <laughs> unknown. Um, but uh, yeah, we, um, uh, we contacted Kathleen straight away because she's just been well she and Fried. I mean they would when, when we were filming there they were just so lovely to us you know they were so supportive and helpful and uh, and then when we took our group uh, you know when we had our group of Americans came over uh, with uh, Rick Pettigrew from the archaeology the um, TAC the archaeology channel uh, from Oregon and uh, so we were taking them all over the place and Kathleen was just utterly brilliant at the Tomb of the Eagles with her uh, with the tales she was telling she was wonderful uh, so yeah we're definitely going to miss her I mean we, we, we are you know obviously we're doing all being well fingers crossed if pandemic allows and all of that we're, we're doing our September tour again this year and I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, persuade Kathleen to allow us to go and visit and maybe we'll drag her out for dinner or something and afterwards. But um, yeah. When we talk about uh, the closure of the Tomb of the Eagles, we don't mean the tomb itself uh, will be closed. Uh, it's the museum that run by Kathleen and Frieda Simonson. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, but the, the, the issue at the moment is, uh, is maintaining public yeah. access because, exactly, uh, yeah. it, you know, there, it's not like there's a, lot, a whole load of signposts, you know, where, from yeah, where you yeah. park. It's uh, how, how far is it? It's not half a mile walk, but it might as well be a half a mile walk <laughs> from the car park to, uh, yes. to the tomb itself. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Very sad, very sad. But we, you know, we do wish them uh, all the very best. It's been very difficult yeah. for them during the yeah. pandemic. Uh, and you know, I'm sure the, the interest has been crippling. I'm sure the interested parties will pull together and uh, something uh, good will uh, come out of it. It's anyway. it's too important a site to um, to not, you know. So, yeah, I'm sure they will. I just hope it's done, you know, in the most pain-free way for uh, Kathleen and Frida. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Hey, anyway, hey, in the yeah. meantime, here's cheers, cheers to you, Cork Williams. You are a superstar, <laughs> and thank you for your kind words and uh, and your support. That's um, gilding the lily. That is crazy of you. Thank you all the same, though. 
Uh, you, 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 have, uh, you have the better of me uh, here, so... Uh... <laughs> well, uh, Cork is all lit up in yellow in the, in the uh, uh, chat there. Yeah, oh, am so... I looking in the wrong place? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh... Anyway, we're faffing a bit. Um, <laughs> Thank you, uh... Cork. Thank you very much. Yeah. There um... was a question or two, uh, Sibylla, was it? Uh... Da, 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 da. I ask briefly uh, what you got out of the Megalithomania uh, conference. Um, can we answer that another time, Sibylla? I mean, it, it, it would it we would start off a whole load of talking points, and um, uh, <coughs> I, I think don't you, Rupert? Can we? Yeah, I do. Uh, ask ask um, us in ask us inside Patreon if you see what I mean. Yes, and we'll chinwag <laughs> with you um, at length. Yes. Yeah. Um, All right. Cool. Uh, and We enjoyed uh, it, though. It was good fun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and what is the tour called? Where does it go and when? Costs. Mm. Uh, in brief, um, we're not entirely sure that it's going ahead this year. It is booked. Everything is booked. Do you know hotels. what? While we've been sitting here right now, I've okay. just had an email come in from Rick Pettigrew that I haven't read. I just saw the alert come in saying uh, from Rick. So... Uh, so <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not going to be distracted into reading all that now. If you go to the uh, the Archaeology Channel uh, yes. website, though, yeah, uh, there is uh, there is a section uh, for Archaeology tours Channel and... tours. It's called TAC yeah. Tours, isn't it? Yeah, um, and uh, and you'll see us in there. I actually don't know how much it costs. Is the honest truth because we Mike and Quite I just lot. tip up and show people around. We don't, um, uh, you know, we uh, we make sure that we've got hotels lined up and all that kind of stuff and nice coaches, yeah. but we don't actually um, take the money. deal with any of that side of it. We just show people stuff and tell people what we know. Um, I think it's well past time we should be getting on with questions, otherwise we will be here to midnight. To You've got the list. Questions or not, <laughs> I think so. That is it. I'm drawing a line and I'm moving to the first question, <laughs> which is uh, comes from uh, Camille Online. And uh, I've got this. Uh, I can see my phone, but I can't see the writing because it's so far away from me. Hengist Bury Head. Right? Oh, okay. No, cool question, this. Cool uh, question. At the um, mouth of the Avon, due south of Durrington. Can it be coincidence? It's Hengist Bury. It's Hengist Bury, actually. Uh, surely yes. not. Um, what, do, uh, what do we know about this place? Have you been there? Um, is it the front gate <laughs> to uh, Stonehenge? It's a, it's a lovely question, and uh, you know it, it uh, sort of opens up a few things, doesn't it? That we can we can talk about. It 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 does really, and I, I think uh, shall I get the name out of the way first? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's nothing to do with hinges at all. Um, it's uh, it's actually much later, probably Saxon. Um, but um, Kath Walker, as many of you know, Kath Walker, very dear friend of ours. And Kath was actually, uh, in fact, is she still a curator of Hengistbury yeah. Head Visitor Centre? Um, she's been working there for a, quite a long time. And uh, Kath leads people on uh, archaeology tours uh, around the head and uh, well, it's, it's a wonderful place, wonderful place. Anyway, I uh, contacted her because of your question um, and she sent me through this little bit of information that just sums it up way better than we could have done. Can we just uh, say so what it, Hengistbury Head is before we uh, go on talk about the name? Yeah. Well, it's it's a spit of land right on the coast between Bournemouth and what's the other town along the along the coast there, uh, on the English Channel, um, and mm. it's really a spit of land. I don't know how long it's uh, it's been there, um, but it does. Uh, in brief, it has had uh, specific bits of prehistoric inhabitation um, right through from the from. Uh, well, it's Paleolithic onwards. It's, Paleolithic, uh, yeah, uh, onwards. Yeah, Seems, it's. Uh, it Strangely, it seems to be yes. a gap in the Neolithic, but you know, they sort of uh, more stuff in the uh, uh, um, 
Mesolithic and uh, early Bronze mm. and Bronze Age through to the Iron Age. If you uh, if you Google it though and uh, and go to they have a uh, they have a visitor center website mm. and I'm pretty sure because they were redoing it last year that um, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a a, a good wad of information on there. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, regarding the name, it's actually named after Hingist and Horsa. And it says, this paragraph uh, specific in the literature specifically about the name says, it can be fairly said that the large public house opened on Broadway by the Dorset Brewers Eldridge Pope on uh, 3rd of January 1940 was named the Saxon King after the famous Jute. Uh, it was originally to have been named either Hengist or Horsa, although it, has, uh, it was long since demolished for housing redevelopment. So this is all in relation to the name around the head. The connection continued with the new road name of Saxon King Gardens. Indeed, Horsa Road and Rowena Road in Tuckton must have been named after Hengist's brother and daughter, respectively. Although it's well known that a glider used in the Second World War during D-Day landings in France was named after Horsa, there was also a World War II troop transport glider called the Hengist. <laughs> it had an 80-foot wingspan and could be towed at 150 miles, around, miles an hour, fully loaded in a group of three with 15 troops per glider, including the pilot. Now, the reason I read you that was because of the references to Hengist and Hengist's brother, Horsa, um, who were... Saxon, uh, well, they were called the Saxon kings, um, uh, but uh, but it relates to uh, Saxons and nothing as ancient as Henges. It is purely, purely coincidence that uh, that it sounds like it should be a Henge. It's yeah. Hengist. It's a hard G in Hengistbury yeah. head. Uh, yes, and also the other uh, aspect of this is the etymology of the word henge. Um, well, yes. Yeah. Did, uh, mm. uh, henge didn't mean what it means now, to us now, until 1937. That's when no. the, 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 the word was, you know, the term was coined to mean what it means to us. It, it, the word itself is older than that, otherwise Stonehenge wouldn't be called Stonehenge. Um, but again, mm. it, it um, the the word goes still only back to Middle Ages or something like that, where you've it's a real to, irony. refers to a cliff. Uh, there's henge henge cliff. It means a steep hanging thing. Um, yes, a, but a the, stone, the but that's yeah. the irony that the the the, yeah. uh, the the name was used referring to the hanging lintels. Yeah. Um, and uh, and the fact that henges, as we know them today, don't have anything to do with that at all. It's that you know the name was coiled for Stonehenge, and Stonehenge isn't a henge. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, so yeah. that that's just uh, that's just the British being perverse, really. Yeah, technically speaking, yeah. but um, yeah, yes. the word as we use. Uh, it, if any it? of you need qualification, there, why isn't Stonehenge a henge? Is that uh, technically a henge has the ditch inside the bank, and Stonehenge has the ditch outside the bank. Um, so uh, yes, it's as simple as that. Stonehenge isn't a henge, but henges are named after Stonehenge. <laughs> let's move on to let's move on to the next question. And thank you for mm -hmm. that, uh, Camille. Online, uh, hope you're there. Hope uh, that uh, satisfied you. Um, Pat asks, when megaliths are removed from their original landscapes, put on display, do you think their original context can be adequately portrayed, or is this impossible? It's, mm. a, it's a really fascinating sort of uh, subtle question in many ways, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's so many different ways of unravelling it. Go on, what are you going to say? Well, I was going to say there aren't that many examples I can think of where uh, megaliths have been removed from their original landscapes and, and put on display, if you see what I mean. Um, 
Do you know, I'll tell you what I find interesting, and it would be interesting. If, Pat, if you're if you're there, if you're watching, then do yeah. chip in in comments because uh, yeah. I'd love you to be involved in this. Um, what is intriguing for me here is that there are a couple of instances, um, or no, fair enough, fair enough, there are a few instances that I can think of where megaliths have been removed well, from uh, their original... Jay, Doors of Perception chipped straight in with Calderstones, Liverpool, which... You know, which yeah, uh, OK, yeah, which is what you said to earlier on today. So, yeah, yeah um, I was thinking of uh, the outside, the external pillar at Brinkethley the on Anglesey, which is a, an engraved uh, stone that... Um, the, the one that's actually there at the site is a replica, yeah. and the original is in the... Um, oh Lord, which museum? I can't remember. Um, it, it's in one of the Welsh museums, anyway. Um, now, the interesting thing there about context is that if you go and look at the the pillar at Brinkethley, there you wouldn't know it was a replica. In which case, I would say, well, no, the context hasn't changed there. But if you go and see the real one in the museum, then obviously, out of context, it's it's just a stone. Um, context yeah. is everything. Mm. Uh, it, so, yeah, I mean, the Calder Stones, they've lost all context anyway, haven't they? Well, um, the thing is, even where they originally were, their context would have been lost anyway because they originally they were a long barrow or, or a chambered yeah. tomb of, of some sort. So they mean yeah, nothing as yeah. standing stones in, in, the, in the landscape unless we're talking from a very subjective point of view and, uh, and and not expecting to learn stuff from the relationship of the stones to the context, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. See, I suppose it depends what you mean by removed from their original landscapes because, you know, when yeah. you think of it in those terms, then, I mean, look at the London stone, which, <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the, the le legend has it, you know, that it was, it's the just all that remains. It's the top of a pillar that was part of a stone circle going back thousands of years. Um, but all we know is that that's what's always been attached to it. And there it sits in a glass box in the middle of, uh, what road is it on? Is it Clarendon? I can't remember. It's in London anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. I know yeah. I've said it. I know I've written it and I don't remember. Um, yeah. In archaeology, of course, context is everything. Uh, and mm. uh, something removed to a museum ceases to be able to give more information in these mm. sorts of ways, you know, unless it's something that can be. Uh, examined further and under museum or um, uh, academic con conditions, um, but you're, you're absolutely right. Once you remove something from its context, unless the context is recorded meticulously, um, then mm. uh, you, you lose what you can learn from it. If anything, that's a pro but that's the problem with standing stones with megaliths. There's very little you can learn from them per se, mm. unless they have alignments, unless, you know, they, they, they have uh, uh, any kind of uh, inscriptions upon them. Or, uh, Do you know what? I, I know it's yeah, not go going back. Uh, I know it's not going back as far as we normally would, time-wise. Going back, back, but back in the, time. <laughs> and not, probably not far enough. But, but okay. one of the most significant places I can think of is... Mackold on the Isle of Man. Now, if you go to the church in Mackold, uh, yes. in the graveyard, over mm. to one side of the graveyard, there is an entire collection of Viking uh, rune stones. These are they're, they're megaliths. You know, they're tall standing stones. Um, I say tall. I mean, they vary from you know meter and a half to a couple of meters tall. So they're from medium to large. Stunningly engraved, some of them. But they're just there as this collection in the graveyard. And then you go to the Manx Museum in Douglas, and again, they have a stunning collection of these stones. But because they've been sort of gathered together 
as this collection of stones, they don't mean anything at all. You know, it's like having a collection of jewellery when you don't know what the gifts were about mm. or something. Do you know what I mean? They're, they, they've lost all their meaning because they're just a collection of stones. Yeah. Um, I think there are quite a lot of um, displaced stones in Brittany from within uh, the huge tombs that they have there. Uh, around mm -hmm. uh, the Bay of Morbihan and uh, and around there, uh, and uh, I think that the museum at Karnak has got quite a lot of uh, stuff taken mm. from inside uh, tombs. Um, but that's a kind of a kind of a different thing in a way. I don't know. I don't know. I tell you what, though, strangely enough, I mean, there are. Mm, oh, there's a place actually we'll be talking about later on where it, there's a sort of sort of uh, subtle. Um, aspect of the question we're answering. I don't think I'll plot spoil now. We'll wait until we uh, okay. uh, get to it. Uh, it's, a, it's another aspect of what's um, what's being said here. Oh, I know where you're going. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can't think of anything more to say about that the, the topic. Well, I think we're in agreement uh, that not only do you lose the of course you lose the aesthetic but also what purpose a stone in a museum and it doesn't go on that often really we can name a few but it really doesn't happen that often actually can i go off on one just for a minute oh please um, do <laughs> <laughs> well it just reminded me I, do, I i don't know why i hadn't thought about it until uh, right now but uh, the correlation that I can think of is, is me banging on about the Coggy Indians again in northern Colombia, that uh, they're descendants of the Tyrona civilization. And what the Tyrona civilization used to do, they, they were completely, their whole ethos was living at one with nature. And, uh, and they used to make these little figurines quite weird art actually but all these the figurines were representative of all sorts of creatures from nature you know whether it's you know bats or monkeys or you know just all sorts of things and they're about this sort of size tiny little figurines and they used to tie them throughout the jungle they just used to tie them in the trees because it was their respect and them showing their love of uh, of mother nature and then of course along came the spanish and they just nicked them all so they just stripped all these beautiful gold things out of the jungles and if you go to the gold museum in bogota they have a room that is uh, it's like fort knox you literally you go through this door that is this massive steel door and you you you're in this room it's a cylindrical room you're in the middle of the cylinder and it's just this circle of glass cases that is just thousands and thousands of these gold things that the spanish nicked from the tyrona and the coggy indians of course they keep saying we want them back and everybody knows well you're not getting them back because there'd just be war with everybody coming to steal all the gold from the thing because it's worth just a uh, priceless so much gold but that's such a good correlation i think that there you had something that had absolute meaning in its place in the jungle and along come these other people who say well we like those we'll go and put them in here and and suddenly you've got this room that's well, it's nice to see the room but it means nothing except that it's worth a lot of money you know what i mean yeah have you frozen i'll show oh, you had me Oh no! You, you, oh, sorry, you had me worried. You'd, you'd frozen. Uh, I shouldn't have frozen. Before. Have we lost him? Have we lost him? Do we need to send out the search parties? Uh, <laughs> Sibylla says, uh, "No, has, that was it really? It was just... Yeah. Has any society sorry. ever lived in complete harmony with nature? Inverted commas, as uh, uh, as we do. The Tyrona did I... until the Spanish rocked up. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, anyway, yeah. we could go off, as you say, we could uh, we could go off on one. Um, yeah, hope that, um, you know, mm. um, well, those are our thoughts anyway, uh, such as they are. And with that, I'll move on to the next question from... Yes, Corks just said my culture did. Yes, you did. Oh, I was saving that. Hold on. That's not what you <laughs> That's for later. Oh, That's it's for not later. for now. 
It's for now, yeah. Um, so, uh, Stuart Anthony asks, Hello, do you have any thoughts or ideas on what burnt mounds may have been used for? Uh, tell us. I just want to what say is, if Stuart what... is... Uh, sorry, I was just going to say, if I don't know if Stuart's watching, but as, uh, firstly, Stuart, hello. Long time no, no hello. Um, <laughs> we've known Stuart for a long time. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, good to have a question from you. Um, uh, go on, do you want me to or do you want to? Well, first, what is a burnt mound? What's particular about a burnt mound? What a is it, burnt why are they a thing? Um, a burnt mound is, uh, not surprisingly, a mound <laughs> that is full of burnt material. It's, uh, it's pretty much all burnt stones. There's a lot of charcoal and burnt, cracked stones. Um, there are a staggering amount of them. There's nearly 2,000 of them known in Scotland. I can't remember how many there are in Ireland, but it's certainly at least around a thousand, probably a lot more than that, actually. Um, but the thing is that they were everywhere. Um, not uh, the mostly known in Scotland and Ireland. I think there there are quite a mm. few around Britain. But the trouble with Britain, the rest of Britain, yes, date dates oh well uh, the earliest was well they're mostly bronze age aren't they but um uh, but i think I, late I neolithic I, through to, yeah, through to, late through neolithic into bronze, bronze age bronze. Yeah, yeah yeah um such as they have <laughs> um but uh, the honest truth is there there is only one i don't know about you mike there's only one that i know personally you know one that i have stood yeah. upon Yes. Uh, and that is the little mound at um, uh, uh, just by the Tomb of the Eagles. Yeah. Um, uh, I, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't visited another one. Of course, I might have done them not knowing what I was standing on. Um, uh, no, that, that's right. Because, I mean, to the eye, we're not talking about particularly about a mound. I mean, because they comprise of, uh, they are structured. Hmm. Um, I think, shall I show, show the video? Because that's yeah, the do. wonderful thing. Uh, when uh, 2019, on our tour that year, uh, mm. when we went up to um, uh, Tomb of the Eagles, as you, you walk, you know, well, it's over, well, it's about half a mile walk, isn't it, from uh, the museum to the it actual is. tomb, uh, yeah, when yeah. you get there. And on the way, you walk past a Bronze Age burnt mound, would you believe? Um mm. And uh, so I'll just resume the last video and uh, you'll see. Oh, no. Let me just wind that back a little, actually, because that that guy in blue, is Rick. there's Rick. <laughs> and that's the guy that organizes uh, the, um, uh, the the tours. And, Top man. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's Rick, Rick, uh, Rick Pettigrew. And he's pointing at... There is, that's not what you'd have thought in your mind as being a burnt mound. That's not a mound, is it? Mm. That's a, um, that, that's a, you know, the remains what looks like uh, a building um, there yeah. in, the, in, in the grass. And, you know, a deliberately made floor. Can you see it around there? Yeah. And mm. several uh, structures within looking like uh, stone tubs here, there. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you know, and surrounded by uh, the, the wall. Uh, one wonders how this area would have been roofed. But that looks to me, you know, like it's been pretty carefully constructed. Um, mm. Well, they... They... Oh. We can't say for sure that they were all exactly the same. Uh, well, in fact, we know that they weren't all exactly the same because some of them had channels and some of them didn't have channels. But whichever way you look at it, uh, they were quite clearly meant to be associated with water. And the general consensus is that the, uh, all the cracked stones, the burnt stones, it was to do with heating water. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of 
what they were used for. My personal opinion is that they weren't just for one thing. They It was a way of heating water and having fresh hot water coming through these channels and being dispersed. Um, and and so anything that you can think of that might uh, um, you know need hot water it is fair game for possible usage here um, yeah, uh, yeah. from you know cooking or brewing or or even you know laundry maybe um, <laughs> bathing some people think they were for bathing but our friends uh, uh, Merrin Dinley and uh, who and lives on them not Graham, far away from them who, by yeah, the way. They, yeah, yeah they do. Uh, in fact, go on. Now you you explain uh, um, Merrin's um, thinking on. Well, uh, so far as I can remember, in detail, you know, I can't. She's talked through it um, quite in detail herself, and she knows so much about the brewing and particularly the malting process. We always say brewing, and she says, "No, no, no. Think about malting and the process of malting. It's our misunderstanding mm. of the process of making of beer that has us miss the possibilities of what these places were for." Now yeah. I can't I can't remember the exact detail of that. I refer you to an interview we did way back in 2018 with uh, mm. Merrin and her husband, and it's fascinating, um, you know, w how much they'd done work on on this. And I have to say, it's it's right up up there uh, in my favourite purposes for uh, what might have been burnt mounds and many other buildings besides that we see in prehistory through right through the Neolithic um, mm. um, that you know there's heat involved all that kind of things especially prepared floor uh, yeah mm. um, uh, malt, it's one of the malting, things that is so brewing, compelling beer one of the things that's so compelling about um uh, Merrin and Graham's theories on this about malting yeah. is that uh, so many of these places have clay lined yeah. or lime coated floors. So mm -hmm. basically they've laid a stone floor and then completely sealed it with, uh, with clay or lime, whatever. So that it's, uh, uh, if you're using grains, then for malting, the grains have to be able to sprout upwards. Mm. And you don't want grains falling through any cracks. You know, you've, you've spent all this time gathering yeah. the grain. And, uh, and so to have any lost down cracks or gaps in stones where they could then uh, germinate, uh, because you have, for, for, for malting to take place, you have to capture them and arrest the growth at exactly the right point, because that's when the sugars remain inside the grain itself and it stays sweet. If you let it germinate, then uh, so beyond a tiny point, then you actually lose the sweetness. And that's the whole point about, you know, we use it today, malt biscuits or, or whatever. In fact, Graham thinks that the malting in these places would not just have been about brewing it is about the malting it's if you want something sweet it's you know maybe they put it in bread or what have you and you know his, his thinking is that they they would have used it for food for ages it was probably a long time before they realized that if you put it in beer it actually made it so much nicer uh you know it's a really really interesting theory and and it makes you start looking at prehistoric buildings in a very different way um and, makes and all reasons the sense. why they may have burnt down as well yeah 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 as Mary yeah. says look um, look to that if a building's been burnt down accidents happen you know fire was involved mm. and we're talking about uh, combustible buildings mm. so yeah you know, interesting do you know what in fact it's it, it's it's worth tagging on to that it, it it's not to do with burnt mounds but it's to do with that aspect there is a whole uh, school of thought in archaeology that is about uh, the burning and decommissioning of buildings. And uh, this you can see it everywhere that people say that, you know, these things were, they were destroyed with fire and what have you. But the thing is, we are talking about a time in, uh, in human history where that's all they had for light was flame. Yeah. And their houses were made of wood. 
it's really not a surprise that there's what quite a possibly few examples go wrong? of burnt ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I actually, I, I personally, I think that this notion of burning and decommissioning is, I think it's absolute nonsense. I think it's just accidents happening. Um, yeah. Anyway, there you go. Yeah, I think we've do done well on uh, on burnt mounds then. Hope you I hope that's that. answered your question, Stuart, and I hope you're well, and I hope your wife's well. Um. <laughs> right, next. Uh, Benjamin Lofi. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Crook Barrow Hill near Worcester is known locally as the Tump. What are its origins and how long has it looked that way? Is it a barrow, a tomb, and if so, who might be buried there? Uh, well, mm. I mean, uh, despite the glee with which we set off on this, we, we, we don't have an answer to, to those questions any more than anybody else does <laughs> until somebody gets a shovel out, I suppose. <laughs> uh, yeah. For those of you, you who haven't you seen it think... before, it, it's sort of like a slightly flattened mini Silbury Hill type structure, isn't it? It's, it's round, yeah. uh, that's, that sort of thing going on. Uh, but... Um, yeah, not quite so pronounced as uh, Sil Silbury, uh, nor so well, large. You, you might wonder, you know, why why are we including it if we don't have anything to say about it? Yeah, that's um, true. <laughs> why <laughs> are we including it as a question? But the re the reason we included it as a question is that if you, you can you can Google this place, uh, if you yeah, yeah. Google Crook Barrow Hill, it's actually got a few uh, names. It's um, it's, was there Whittington's Tump is another one, and yeah. Uh, it has a few so. names. Um, but the reason we included it is that if you just uh, you know, Google it and have a look at um, some of the photographs, I think it's pretty clear to see that it, archaeologists have described it as partially artificial. And I... I think that it's a very deliberate mound. I mean, you know, we, yeah. we, we say like a mini silbury, and I think that's very much the point that maybe there's a barrow on it. I wouldn't surprise me if there is, mm. but I think that that it's very likely that it was a significant uh, place uh, across a very wide social uh, uh, range. Really, um, uh, I mean, dating it is. You, you, you can't, you can't date it. You can't date it. Well, no, unless somebody's got, it? as I say, unless somebody's got the trowels, you know, got the shovel out and the and the trowels, which. But unless you got has. right to the uh, to the bottom of it and found, uh, you know, from what point was it made artificial? You know, even if you even if you did find a grave in it, then you you could tell the the uh, the date of the grave, but that wouldn't necessarily tell you the date of the the mound yeah, itself. Yeah. I think there was a flint um, found upon it. That's it. That's about it. Yeah, something like that—a flint or a scrape or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, tump. Tump. Which means, could just have been what somebody dropped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, tump means a little rounded hill. That's about it. It's a bump. Tump. Yeah. It's a bump. Tump. Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, but it, it's it is interesting because you can look at various places. I mean, okay, so you've got you've got Silbury Hill, and then you've got the um, the the mound in Marlborough, which is like a a, a sister to um, to Silbury, Silbury Hill, um, you know it it makes sense that people would make these mounds in the landscape, even if they were you know you can imagine it as a place for could you have had a, a beacon on it or um, something like that. <laughs> People being clever, people. clever. Andrew Brooks says, <laughs> well, what, what's a tump? Don't know. Ask Hetty Pegler. <laughs> yeah, she's dead, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think it's interesting when, you, when you've got any place like this that, that clearly is artificial, uh, yeah. at, at least to some extent. So you've got you know, uh, people leaving their mark in the landscape uh, a very, very long time ago. And what was it for? They might have held concerts on the top of it and everybody sat in the field underneath. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, more than Silbury Hill, I was reminded more of, uh, you know, a mini Maeve's Cairn. I, uh, the thing is, nobody's dug in <laughs> that mound point. as far as we can see, so I don't even know 
you know what what the materials how how it was built up and with what um that's true with, with that's uh, true. i mean there are archaeologists yeah. that still dispute that it's artificial at all so i can't see that it's natural in that place it doesn't yeah no no yeah. i think anybody arguing that is but i'm afraid benjamin losing. i think we're as beyond that uh, we're as mystified as anybody and until the but we're Somebody... acknowledging the worthiness of the mystery. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the there's thing. more than one tump around the place. Mm. Think on that. You know, we're not just talking a little mini tumulus here. Uh, it's pretty significant with its, uh, with its tree on the mm. top. <laughs> Onward, let us yeah. answer now Malcolm Bannister's question. Uh, would love to have our opinions on the prehistoric rock art and the other interesting stuff uh, that uh, is at or near uh, Garden's Edge in the Peak District site uh, near um, near Baslow, Derbyshire. Yeah, mm. and uh, I thought when the 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 name uh, rang a bell. Haven't been there. I have to hold up my hand. I don't think you have either, Rupert. Though of course we no, I haven't. No, we we've been close to it, but we uh, close we to it, but it, no. not actually uh, uh, up mm. at uh, um, Garden's Edge. And then I suddenly remembered uh, why it had um, uh, peaked. I, I, I suddenly remembered that I'd been hunting around for something I wanted to. I haven't done it yet. Um, obviously, uh, but I was hunting around for somewhere that was relatively near that I could just go and point a camera at and and bring some nice mm -hmm. footage back for folk to, to look at. And, and Garden's Edge was one that came across my radar. Uh, and um, can you say words for a moment? Because I just need to... Uh, I can say words. Why have you got a picture of it? Um, I have. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to, well, the, I'm the, going to the, 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 the apple cart the, This here. bit of rock art. Yeah, go on. Okay, well, I was going to say about this rock art. You see, I don't think that's Bronze Age at all. I think that's oh. seriously late. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think oh, which that, later. Uh, which, which? What are you talking yes. about? The well, if you're going to show the um, uh, the stone uh, 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 that has been replicated, this wall. <laughs> where is it? Monthly Q and A, May. Garden's There's just something about that that uh, sniffs of different tool use later. That yeah, I I think that's late. Have you? Uh, there there is a photograph. You you, can, you you have a point there. It doesn't jive with a lot of. It really doesn't. The uh, there is one photograph that's looking yeah. down on it. Uh, you yeah. haven't got that one, have you? I've got more detail. I think that it may be there. Do you want me to put that up instead? If if that yeah, I mean when you're ready. But if, if there's there's the the photograph looking do down that. on it, um, and you can uh, here we go. Yeah, well you'll probably see what I mean. Yeah, that's the one. Well done. I, that that see you when you look at uh, Neolithic rock art even going into Bronze Age possible rock art, that mm. there is a, there's a jizz to them, you know? There's a feel to them that, uh, that they, they just kind of belong. And this looks far more like children's doodling. There's something about this that is not coming from the same place. Mm. Um, that, that the largest dip... Uh, you know that that cup on the lower right there. The fact that that's got a hard cylindrical uh, cut, if you like, it's steep sided. Yes, that's like no other rock art I've seen. That that to me smacks of a completely different tool use. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a modern, more modern folly. Uh, yeah. I mean, when I say modern, I mean you know it could be hundreds of years old. But yeah, I don't so it think doesn't it's sort of have that feel of depth of tradition behind it, no. and, and repeatability, and uh, um, it, it looks whimsical <laughs> compared to yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah that's, Com that, that's actually a good, a good way of describing it. Yeah, yeah, it, I, it, I, I it, don't buy it at all. It doesn't have the cultural unity that. Um, Mm. Uh, rock art from the Neolithic uh, has, uh, if I can, you know, sort of in, invent that phrase. But 
Mm. Uh, leading on from what we were talking about earlier about uh, originality of um, rocks in their landscape, uh, what we were looking at there was not stone. No, <laughs> no, that one not. It's. Uh, no. I'll put it up again, the the larger thing, but it's actually um, fiberglass. Yeah. Um, it was coming, you know, the, the original stone was coming in for a lot of attention. And I think the original stone is actually underneath the fiberglass. Or has it been carted? Oh, is it? I, I, thought think... they'd, I thought they'd carted that off to uh, Oh, to can somebody museum? clarify oh, that right. for us? Uh, we're, uh, may, uh, clearly, this is um, something we don't know what we're talking it's, about. But it's yet. interesting, though, harping back to Pat's uh, question earlier on about things being yeah. taken away from their original um, context. Yeah, yeah. Um, but having said that, I mean, what an absolutely fabulous replica it is. Well, apparently, you wouldn't know if you, unless you apparently hit it. even if you go there, you know, not only from the photograph, but if you actually go there and look at it, it's indistinguishable unless you tap it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you can hear that it's uh, hollow. Uh, yeah. hear that it, it's, it's hollow. But um, uh, yeah, somebody will have to um, uh, wise us up on that as to whether um, the original stone can... is hidden underneath or Ooh. whether it's been carted away to someone else. Uh, uh, and that's all we know about Garden's Edge, actually. Um, hold on a second. I can tell you that um, discovered in the mid-60s, diddly diddly do. Um, not till then. Uh, yes, uh, it was removed. This, so this one was made in 1996. Uh, yeah. The replica... Blah, 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 Okay, I don't know where it. Uh, 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 yeah, okay, I'm not going to read the whole page. Uh, I don't know where the original is, but this one is polyester resin and fiberglass. Okay. Uh, Hello to Sweden. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you. Hello to Sweden. <laughs> I think we've petered out on that one, and uh, 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 unless yeah, sorry, Malcolm, I was just trying to find out where it was. But uh, uh, Malcolm, you're you're here, and you can uh, uh, you know say more about where your question was uh, was coming from. Um, that's mm. as enlightened as we uh, get on this matter. <laughs> but thanks for the question again. It's had us look again at something we already knew but had forgotten. Ah, <laughs> mm. uh, Cork, Cork Williams, all the way from Australia. Bless ya. Is Scara Bray a romantic reconstruction, or is it as it should, uh, uh, or is it as um, it stood in situ? And uh, how mad are you <laughs> that I had to ask the question? Looking at you, New, Look new Grange. You, new Grange. Grange. <laughs> yeah, so I completely understand why Cork has asked this question because, yeah. uh, as some of you will know, I, we, we had a bit of a rant about. Uh, Newgrange being uh, a monstrosity on the outside. Uh, yeah. No, Scarra Bray is uh, is completely genuine. There is only one. This is so sweet. Uh, there is only one aspect of Newgrange. There is only sound. one aspect of the Scarra Bray. <laughs> Stop years calling you slapping, slapping my forehead. <laughs> Um, there's only one aspect of Scarabray that is uh, that is not genuine, and that is when Gordon Child uh, discovered it in eighteen whatever it was, and then he he um, he excavated it and tidied it up uh, in oh, it was the early twentieth century, wasn't it, that he did that? Yes, um, and it was it was his daughter, his young daughter. Uh, who used to play in it, and she thought that it was very sad that the people who used to live there didn't have windows. So he actually put a window, I think it's Hang in the, I've uh, got, I've the, got... the sea-facing wall of House One. If you don't know what we're talking about. Uh, oh. Oh, there you go. Well done. Uh, oh, look, the beardy man. Yes, um, that's me. So... <laughs> So that window, window. just uh, beside Mike's uh, head there, that window was put in by Gordon Child because his daughter thought that the people should have had windows in their houses. <laughs> um, 
yeah. so apart from that, the rest of it is uh, is completely genuine. Uh, yeah. It's lovely. It's lovely, yeah. and all the more profound and evocative because it's completely genuine. You know. Yeah, yeah. And it wouldn't have looked like that then. <laughs> what with you sitting there? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, in, in terms Martin of, says he's looked through that window. <laughs> uh, uh, in, in, ter in terms of, uh, I mean, you know, there's green grass growing around it. You know, it looks a bit tel Teletubby-ish. It looks a bit Hobbit, Hobbiton the way that it is uh, now. And of course, you know, where are the roofs? <laughs> roofs have uh, long since uh, gone. Um, and we don't know how proud they stood of the uh, out of the uh, surrounding land or not, um, yeah. but I think. But the uh, and again, for that window to be there, it's obvious that the walls needed to be built up again out of the um, uh, the stone uh, found. Uh, but nothing has been imposed. I think that's the difference with uh, with Newgrange. Mm. No, nobody's stylistic ideas have been imposed mm. uh, upon it, apart from the window. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have, with with all due respect, you know, I have to take issue with what uh, Joan has said here. You know, she said Newgrange would have totally disintegrated if the monstrosity hadn't been put in place. And the thing is, Joan, that you're kind of half right. But the th the thing is that um, O'Kelly, when he designed that, you know, uh, that they they completely went off on one with that design. They could have reconstructed it. You, you've only got to go across the road, if you like, and look at Nouth. Yeah. Um, you know, and that that is far more how Newgrange would have looked, Except albeit they, okay, there got, are differences. That's got concrete and plinths uh, holding. That the, does have concrete plinths, but at least the style is more in keeping. It's yeah. the fact that they put that great big facade of quartz up. When if you go to Nelth, that you can you can see that the quartz would actually have been a white pavement, not a white. Mm. Um, fascia yeah. uh so it's things like that you know I, I, they could have reconstructed it uh, with a lot more authenticity for the period um but you're right they needed to restore it or it would have disappeared but um yeah, i, yeah, I sure. still think they I mean, could have was, been uh, it was in a little less flamboyant <laughs> let's face it um, yeah yeah you know, but uh yeah, it's created controversy and i it's it's awful because when you look at it, it, it it's so clear yeah and we have the advantage of having been alive in the 1970s, but it, you know, that it's so clear it's of its yeah. time. It's like Habitat yeah. Land. It's like <laughs> yeah. That's um, exactly. Jasper yeah. Conran. It's uh, like so many uh, buildings that were going up at that time using found yeah. materials in, in modern structures. It's just, it, it reminds mm. me of the BBC, old B BBC TV centre. <laughs> Yeah, it does. I'm not wrong, am I? It does. I no, you're not wrong, and I actually, to be honest, I hadn't even thought about that. But you're you're right. Yeah, yeah it, it yeah. does a bit. It does a it's bit. It's not that people uh, do these it, things it, consciously, but you know these things, cultural uh, mm. zeitgeist things, they have resonances, mm. and people, you know, yeah. unconsciously or consciously. I, I, I think the the problem. Do you know? What? I mean, the question was about Scarborough Bray. We could go on about yes, New Grange all we've, night. We've <laughs> got off on one. I think the Grouchy Hat went on yeah. a bit there. <laughs> it did a bit. It did a bit, um, yeah. but you know, it, it, it does illustrate though that uh, you know th th sometimes people just they want something so much that they refuse to see anything else. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and and the thing about that facade at Newgrange is that there is no way that that could exist without the yeah. God knows how many gallons yeah. of concrete that hold it up. Oh. Uh, I just I just forgotten know. and uh, Kevin um, of course po pointed it out coming back to drive back back let's go back to Scarborough Bray that as you come out mm -hmm. of the visitor center on the uh, right hand side the, there's um, a, a full reconstruction that you can walk into that is mm -hmm. roofed and gives you a far better mm -hmm. idea of the of the very dark enclosed space I think that's the <coughs> massive yeah. difference that, you know because the, if they're being mm. open to the skies it makes them appear light and mm. stuff but uh, there were no windows mm. there were no windows and they were mm. roofed they were very dark inside and, uh, yeah well yes um flickering flickering flames and uh, yeah. yeah yeah 
Mm. Where are we? Where, where were we? Ah, yes. I hope that. Well, thank you, Cork, for the question, and uh, I hope that's um, satisfied uh, uh, your querying mind. Let us uh, ask uh, answer Sibylla's question. Uh, or at least make an attempt. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to uh, <laughs> uh, do it uh, do it justice. Have you got it to, to hand there, Rupert? I can't read it on the screen here because the letters are too small. Yeah, Lynn, uh, Lynn uh, Kelly. Sibylla yeah. said, Lynn Kelly has strong arguments for many prehistoric sites and portable objects functioning as mnemonic devices, encoding memory of vital information about the environment, geography, the calendar, and the laws and history of a given culture, as well as their ancestors' stories and beliefs. Do you give credence to this theory? Um, it's a good question, Sibylla. For those of you yeah. that don't know... This is the book that Sibylla is talking about. Uh, well, in fact, you didn't mention a book specifically. I mean, this is uh, this is the book that Lynn Kelly wrote predominantly ab ab about uh, all her theories around things. It's um, uh, she's a hugely respected uh, author and researcher, Lynn Kelly. Um, she actually uh, she's used one of our reconstructions in here the reconstruction of uh, stanton drew uh, uh to answer your question um yes and no <laughs> um i i do think you know there are so many cultures around the world who particularly the cultures who didn't have the written word per se and uh, and so mnemonics and uh, and any kind of uh, construct for memory were hugely important um uh, you know from from south america through africa just uh, and uh, you know and the um australian uh, aborigines you know i mean yeah. just uh, in, in fact i mean lynn uh, i think lynn is australian isn't she um I, yeah that i sort of yes i think she is I think she is, um, and uh, so you have, you know, the um, the it's the the song lines, isn't it, and the dream lines of uh, of Australian uh, indigenous culture. Uh, Cork will be able to uh, berate me for not yeah. saying things properly, um, but uh, I I do think that. Uh, yes, I think there's an awful lot of that aspect would be integral to a lot of the prehistoric stuff that we see anywhere. Do I think that those things were necessarily connected around the world? No, um, I don't. I just think that it's something that humans do um, in given situations in exactly the same way as, and I'm not being glib, but in exactly the same way as a woodpecker remembers where it's stored its hazelnuts. You know, I, yeah. I just think it's something that as an animal, it's something that we do. We find ways of well, remembering uh, things well, I think that to, to and sharing point, that memory. To the point, I think it's something we've hugely forgotten how to do, or there is not really a, a tradition of, of keeping these kinds of skills Alive, I think there are a few people that uh, teach them up and uh, you know dotted ar around mm. the world, but it's by no means as ubiquitous as it used to be as a skill. Did the coggy uh, Rupert uh, have anything in in this direction? You know, um, the, the coggy. <laughs> Hold on, you'll love this. Hold on, <laughs> <laughs> I won't be able to hear you for a second. Uh, 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 you won't be able. Okay, you can't. Even saying uh, you were right, Lynn is Australian. Yeah. What has he got from his uh, cabinet of curiosities? What is that? This is one of my most treasured possessions, uh, and this is a coggy poporo. And basically, uh, it's a good with. Um, uh, this top is all made of uh, clay and lime. Um, and this stick uh, goes into the hole in the, uh, in the end there. And what they would do uh, is they chew 
coca leaves yeah. and they bake seashells, uh, which they crush to a powder and put in the gourd. And then this they suck on and mixing the lime with the coca leaves gives them a high. Yeah. Uh, um, but their attitude is uh, that, you know, us in the developed world using drugs for having fun when actually it's all about your communicating with the, the ancestors and the gods and what have you. Yeah. And what they do is this is actually your diary. And you will see, particularly the priests, um, and these are handed father to son. There are women priests who use them, but these are handed father to son. And this is a diary. And what you do is when you, you, you suck on this and it, uh, you know, and, and it puts you into your meditative state or what have you, and, and you see them all the time. They're doing this uh, on the, uh, the gods, and they are writing their thoughts. Um, and it is, you know, it's just a rubbing, but that's what they're doing. They're writing their thoughts. So spiritually, this is the, uh, the receptacle, if you like, of a lifetime or more of spiritual thoughts. Wow. And as I said, they're handed down father to son. And I was, um, I was given this. And, uh, and I was given it. On one of my at the end of one of my trips leaving Colombia, and so the next time I went back to Colombia, I went to the priest who I knew best um, because I I felt really bad that I had this, uh, you know that, that surely this should have gone to, um, uh, you know it should have been handed on to somebody, and and he said no it was given to you he said you keep it it's quite likely that you know if somebody didn't have children and there was nobody to hand it to he said it was absolutely fine that i had it if it was given to me um but i you know that as a as a storage of thoughts as a, i mean how profound is that mm. um uh, how they're shared i don't know i don't speak coggy it went through translators in spanish mm. every time <laughs> um but but to me i just the very fact that i own that is um I find that uh, as moving as standing at Scarborough Bray, there is a oh. lifetime of at least one person's thoughts in that. Uh, so, yeah, if that answers that's your question, right. you know. It's, yes, how wonderful is that? Oh, my goodness. Mm. I didn't know you had that. Yeah. That's the first I've seen yeah. that as well. Cool. My yeah. take on this is uh, I, I find it very attractive, the, the, this thought. Um, uh, and I think it could possibly use, be useful, as so many conjectures, fantastic things to hold in your head as lenses to look through, just in case, just in case you catch sight of something else that gets illuminated further. You know, and that's how we build mm -hmm. up, up, up knowledge. It doesn't mean we can state that it's absolutely categorically true. But if we hold mm. it in our minds and think, oh, what does that look like through that lens if we think that's how they were working? Because I'm absolutely convinced that, um, you know, the bardic traditions have something to, to do this because the, mm. the, 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 mm. the, the training for true bards is uh, extraordinary. The training to be able to remember stuff, to remember Story, because that's how things were communicated. Let's—I I can't imagine anything but that uh, things being communicated way back then were people. There were people traveling and telling stories, and mm. then that, that, uh, and these stories have to be spot on. They are not adapted, not adopted, not changed and, and morphed. But they have they, they to have value. They they knew they had these things had to be remembered absolutely. It's their, mm. without writing, it's their, gra their one grasp on the, uh, uh, mm. on, on their, I dare, to, dare I say it, their history, you know, their ancestors, mm. their, where they've been. What they've been I, I do to, think rock happened. art is, uh, is much yeah. more to do with that than, um, than, you know, we tend to consider probably. Could be, you know, but, but without um, categorically saying uh, so much is, is true that, uh, uh, that Lynn um, thing has, has got it absolutely right. Hold on to that thought and, and uh, mm. uh, look at stuff through that, uh, from that perspective. Mm. 
Very Cork useful. has actually replied there saying, Apologize, uh, apologies, I was driving to work. Yes, song lines. So we're talking about Australia here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, song lines, boundary stones, megaliths, and even coulomon trees were yeah. used to tell our stories and pass down our knowledge to our children, grandchildren. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. On. Yeah. I think, I think it's Thanks, a Cork. tremendous Thank aspect to uh, mm. sink ourselves in. Uh, thank you mm. so much um, for the question, uh, Sibylla. Ian, Ian Tarry. Hi, guys. What are your thoughts on the Hallstatt culture, <laughs> especially with regards uh, to their mm. salt mining? Um, but the differences between the Western parts and the Eastern, uh, uh, despite the obvious cultural connection between the two and the, dif the difference between the Eastern and the Western parts. I'm sorry, we giggled slightly because, you know, we suddenly realized with those two words, Hallstatt culture, you, 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 you yeah. ask something about something so vast and something to be honest yeah. that um, we, we, I haven't looked at into Do you know, um, that the, the, much. The thing is that something has happened very recently. I'm sorry barging in on you, Mike. Uh, something, no, no, no. something that has happened very recently is because we've been talking about Standing With Stones 2 uh, and because we're looking at... Um, well, okay, so many things that have come up comparatively recently. Uh, some of you will probably have heard what we were saying about um, the El Agar culture, for example, yeah, yeah. and the the the, uh, the high-status female uh, buried with all the silver goods, that kind of stuff. And Mike and I realized quite how much we didn't know <laughs> about cultures that existed um, that maybe would be able to give us clues about cultures that nobody knows anything about. And what set us off on this was the fact that you can look at El Agar culture, Bronze Age culture, who were huge and trading across the Mediterranean. Then we were talking, uh, was, it in, was it in the last Q&A? When did it come up um, that... Uh, we were talking about the Halstead salt mines. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, it came up somewhere anyway. Um, and there were various things. So we then we were looking at the Kukutani culture. Have you heard of the Kukutani culture? Um, and uh, just you know various cultures, and realizing that so many of these people were trading in. Britain or through Britain, out of Britain, because we know that there's British tin, for example, has been found uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean, in Israel, um, you know, places like that. So we know that you've got these different cultures who were trading with Britain. Who were the people in Britain? They don't have a name. We don't know who they were. And that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to actually put some flesh on that because we don't know. And so the, the thing with the Halstead culture and the reason we kind of titter is that only a few days ago I said I sent Mike a list <laughs> where I just I, I had spent a day going on a hunt. You know, what are the cultures that uh, that we don't know about? And I kind of expected when I started digging that I'd, I'd find a dozen cultures and say, look, we've got a dozen things to uh, to look up here. <laughs> I came up with how many was it? I don't know, 60, 70, maybe it's more cultures. That, and I think, well, I've heard of them. Yeah. Uh, just so many. And the trouble is that we don't... When I say we, I don't mean us. I mean people generally. Yeah, yeah. These are not these are not cross referenced particularly. There are so many strands that can be drawn together. Do you know what? I think there's seventy Bronze Age cultures known in China, for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> and, and so when you asked us about the Halstead culture and what do we know about them, well, <laughs> well, a little bit. <laughs> Um, not an enormous amount, but what we do know is that they were a very wealthy uh, yeah. culture by uh, uh, by all the evidence. There are no low status burials. All the burials are pretty lavish. There are hardly any known Halstead children's burials. What does that mean? Does that mean did, that they disposed of children in a different way, or did that mean that they were so healthy that children hardly ever died? I mean, it's, uh, uh, don't 
don't know. But mm -hmm. um, uh, metal trading, they traded in uh, copper, bronze, gold. Um, uh, and if they were if they were trading in those metals mm -hmm. and salt, I mean, good grief, the value of salt back then. Um, Hallstatt is a singular place. It's named the culture is named for the town. Oh no, it's not a town. It's even a, it's a, a village, a, 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 a lakeside it, it, village, Hallstatt. Yeah, but but the but the area covered by the Hallstatt culture is vast, huge, huge, Absolutely across huge. most of France. Western Europe. Yeah, uh, yeah, from the um, Balkans across to France. It's extraordinary, uh, and in fact, I think that's one of the the slightly misleading things about so many of these cultures that they're named, the El Argar culture is named after yeah. El Argar, where it was originally found. The Cucutani culture, found in Cucutani, or, um, <laughs> you know, which, you know, I mean, they're named after tiny villages, and yet, you know, God, you know, Lipinski Veer, good grief. I mean, Lipinski Veer goes back, what, 9,000 years or something? And good yeah. grief, you look at the sophistication of their stuff. Oh, uh, glad you mentioned the date, because, of course, um, <laughs> um, Hallstatt is late Bronze Age into... Uh, Hallstatt is late. El Argar is late, yes. Um, into Iron Age, yeah. And yes. Latern, of course, comes after Hallstatt, and, uh, uh, and it's believed, you know, whatever uh, Celtic culture we acquired over here, we mm. believe originated in... Uh, uh, ten <laughs> as well. Uh, east and West, the divide between East and West, that's interesting. Now, are we looking at a, you know, some kind of archaeological construct here, you know, that, that uh, the two are lumped together because there seem to be quite different traditions, East and uh, East and West. Who lumped together? Archaeologists. Yes, no, sorry. I mean, who who are being lumped together? Who uh, not, not the, who's well, doing the, the lumping? The, the, the east, well, the east and the west are being are under the umbrella of Hallstatt culture, which is a tiny village in over in the east. I see what you mean. I, I think it, it's it's commonality of grave goods, commonality of sli of styles, or it, 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 uh, well, that's that's the, what the, I mean. The, the, there's a commonality in the east, and there's a commonality in the west, but they're very different. Oh, did you get that? See, I didn't get that. Ah, we need to do more reading. I think that was at the heart us. of <laughs> this is the trouble. You see, I think this is at the heart of Ian's question, yeah. and well, we're I, not equipped to answer it very well. For instance, I think I, I forgot this right, but there, there there are chariot burials over in the east, but none in the west. That kind of thing, or is it the other way around? And in mm -hmm. the west, they've got armor, uh, armored breastplates. Oh, swords. Mm -hmm. West, you know, swords and daggers in in the west, but not so much in the east. Uh, you know that mm -hmm. that kind of mm -hmm. different. We we do need to do more stuff. reading, folks. I yeah. mean, you know, we um um. <laughs> I think what what we illustrate more profoundly than anything else is quite how much we all have to learn <laughs> because because yeah. we do our best but you know well um, we've, we've we're hoist with our own petard really are we aren't we calling ourselves the prehistory so. guys yeah, very much we, so. we didn't yeah. realize yeah. what kind of, sort yeah. of a lump we were yeah, biting we don't off call by ourselves doing the prehistory know-it-alls do we <laughs> the prehistory know-it-alls yeah um, <laughs> um but I, I think you know one of the things that um that came as a bit of a shock to me it, just in doing this stuff recently is that um, I had always heard about uh, Varna and this Varna man is probably still to this day is one of the most lavish burials Varna ever is on found. the Black Sea. Varna is on the Black Sea. Yeah. Now you've got uh, the and, and we should say culture. over on the west in the uh, Balkan Black Sea, not the yeah. other side, not the. Uh, but you've got the Cucutani culture, who are they're not that far to the north, uh, but it's just because different archaeologists found them in different places and went off and you know wrote all their papers and all the rest of it, and so we have the names of two distinct cultures. And you're looking at two cultures that existed at more or less the same time and within hundreds of miles of each other. Um, and you think, well, were they different cultures or actually are we 
giving names to things just because we've done what we always do as uh, you know as humans is we put things in categories in nice convenient boxes uh when in actual fact we probably shouldn't be doing that at all uh you know when it's when it's that close uh you know would well, I, I can't even think of a suitable analogy, but do you, do you see what yeah. I, I mean? I, you know, I might be wrong, yeah. but I'm just I'm questioning how much we categorise different cultures. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Hallstatt it seems to be a case in point, you know, because we've got Hallstatt A, B, and and before I go any further, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about in relation to what? <laughs> in relation to what? You don't know what you're talking well, about. Well, I mean, there's so much. There's so much. I mean, there's so much there archaeology so much. to do with, yeah. with Hallstatt and the Ten and uh, stuff. And um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's a great I, question. An absolutely there. great question. But I think it just shows that. Uh, do you know what? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. Right. My my mum, uh, my mum gave me this book for Christmas, right? And uh, <laughs> she saw it on a on a, a bookshop shelf and thought Rupert will like that. Yeah. And uh, and and do you know what? It's one that I just you know thanks mum, and I put it on my bookshelf because I've already got so much stuff to read that I hadn't got round to reading it. And because, um, Ian, you sent that question, and, I was, and so I pulled it off the shelf and thought, oh, I'll have a look um, and see if this book talks about Halstead. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. It's a little bit disturbing as well because um, it goes off into a completely unexpected direction about uh, the oh, really? Halstead relationships with the Celtiberians of Spain um and uh, and basically it just showed me that i do have an awful lot more reading to do um just oh lord oh, rupert we should have stuck with rocks in fields <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah they can't talk back <laughs> Anyway, that was more of a talking point yeah. than an answer to your question. Uh, yeah, I yes. don't know if have we answered your question, Ian. I don't know if well, we've answered. You said so. you said could we tell you anything about it? I think we might yeah, have yeah, done a little yeah, bit. Yeah. You, you said good question off. though. You, you lit you the blue that, touch yeah. paper and ran you away. Did. You <laughs> did. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt E. Hi there, Matt. Are you here? Mm. Um, Hello, Matt. Could it be that certain stone was regarded as prized because it was seen as a rarity in the areas where it was found by Neolithic or even earlier? Man, could this be... Um, da -da -da -da, um, Oh, sorry. I thought I was. I thought I had it somewhere else, so I could read it easier. Uh, could it be that this was due to stone being displaced from its original location due to glacial action during the ice age? Um, I'm wondering if this could explain why we see some monuments made from stone that is not local to the area. Really, it's an interesting one here because when I really thought about it, apart from Stonehenge. Mm. What monuments aren't built from stone that's from the local area? Well, it depends what you mean by local. Yeah. Uh, in Britain, there I mean, are no... Uh, Stonehenge is the Rudstone is a... You, you yes. We've got the blue yeah. stones Rud coming Rudstone, from the hundred. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, apart from Stonehenge, then Rudston, I think, is the yeah, which is greatest distance. The Rudston yeah. monolith is one stone that was taken 10 miles or so. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think possibly rather than looking at the megaliths themselves, I think it's yeah. – uh, so, for example, look at the ammonite that is in the portal entranceway of Stony Littleton. Um, you see, I think that it's more things like that that would have been prized where, you know, what, what did the builders – think about an item like that it, you know it wouldn't have made any sense to them it's clearly it, it's an animal that's stone uh, it's a bit like you know the brinkethley the pillar you know they what looks like a, a tree and it's 
stone. I mean, those must have been utterly magical. Um, but then... Uh, Did new grains you know, come from away, Joan? Uh, new, new grains, most of the building material for new grains came from away, away didn't it, I think? Joan's right. There's few and far between where the whole monument, you know, has been displaced from somewhere else. Long Meg, um, uh, Kevin, is, uh, was, does Long Meg itself, herself, come from a distance? Uh, the, those those stones are local, aren't they? The, the stones yeah, the my understanding is that uh, the Rudston monolith is, uh, is the greatest distance of any individual uh, yeah. stone. So you, it, yeah. so you after Stonehenge, Rudston Monolith. I, I don't think there are many that have taken as much as ten miles. There are many that have been taken miles, yeah. but no more than ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it is very. Uh, Joan generally... thinks that uh, that the uh, the Newgrange stones uh, came from Wicklow. Okay, that is quite a way. Yeah. Yes, that is. Um. Yeah, we'd have yeah. to check that. I, I, I don't know, Joan. You, you have one over on us there. I'm not sure, but, um, but yeah, County Wicklow. I mean, that's hello, that's Camille online. I'm afraid we answered your question uh, first, seeing as you uh, <laughs> asked asked it first. I'm afraid you'll have to wind back to the beginning of the evening to. Uh, uh, yes, we your, did. It's uh, nice questions. of you to join us, though. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And thanks for the question. Um, um, the recumbent Kevin says we, the recumbent at uh, Easter Brothers was dragged from six miles. Yeah. Oh yes, um, yes. Uh, a lot of the old. So you, so you, you've got you've got a lot of stones that are um, up to ten miles. I think the yeah. the, the there's a, an awful lot of stones that seem to have been carried about four miles. And the honest truth is, I don't remember where I read this, but I looked it up for something completely unrelated. It was when we were um, something cropped up, and I think it was about the Rudston monolith, and and it might have been Mike Parker Pearson who gave a stat about how nothing was taken further than that, and I thought that can't be right, so I went off on a mission to look it up, um, hmm. and uh, yeah, that does seem to be the case. But yeah, I mean, you think about it though. I mean, look at Old Keeg, uh, yes. which is one of the <laughs> one of the recumbent stone circles in Aberdeenshire, right? So Old Keeg, the altar stone weighs forty tons. And they carried it up to the top of the hill from, I think it's from about four miles away. Yeah. Carrying a stone up to the top of a hill from four miles away. Did I say 40? 40 tons, four miles. Um, I mean, I mean, even four miles for 40 tons, come on. <laughs> That's, you know, they really wanted to do that. Um, yeah. So, I think, yeah, I don't think it needs speak, to be an speaking to Matt's to question, though, I think it's a bit the other way around. It's not that we're honouring the stone. We, we, they uh, are honouring stone particularly. It's just that there's a sense of purpose to what they want to do and the effort they're mm. prepared to go to in order to achieve it. Um, what are you laughing at now? <laughs> So, <laughs> Benjamin said maybe Stonehenge was meant to be in Reading, but they just got exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> or Slough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I've uh, lost yeah. lost the plot. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. There. I'm sorry. Um, um, yeah, and also, there's how much of available stone that is used in ancient monuments actually uh, come from glacial movement. It's relatively rare as well, isn't, isn't it? Yes and no. You, there, there aren't any... Um, there, are, huh, there aren't any. I didn't mean to say that. There aren't many. Um, you know, I mean, okay, there are a lot of glacial erratics, Yeah, but... Uh, but the thing is that when you've got stones that have been ripped up by glaciation and then just gradually left, you know, by uh, by the glacier leaving a snail trail ac across the landscape, um, they, you know, they've tracked an awful lot. I mean, there was a theory that, uh, you know, originally there was the theory that a lot of the uh, blue stones from Priscelli in Wiltshire were because of glaciation. 
but that's long since been disproven. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, am I answering any kind of question there, or have I just gone off on one again? Uh, no, I think you've, uh, I think you've gone off on one actually, Rupert. Gone that way, happens. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, certain stone was regarded as prized because it was seen as a rarity in the areas where it was found by Neolithic man. I, I think the, 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 the trouble is that in the areas that it was used, stone was not a rarity. That's the point. Uh, and, mm. and that's how we get a lot of um, megalithic monuments where they are, because uh, for mm. the most part, I say for the most part, for the most part, the, um, the materials were ready, ready and available without too much uh, effort hence you don't get many stone circles in norfolk indeed and they would have had as many timber as i would imagine uh, yes in the east as um so sp- another way of answering excuse the question me, is, stone anywhere else um, yeah, yeah. So another way of yeah. answering the question Hello, is Gary. no more prized than good timber were it available mm. to you probably mm. just that stone happens to be a bit more permanent I think we've exhausted mm. ourselves there. We've probably exhausted all uh, our friends out there. We've as probably well. exhausted everybody. Yes, uh, Kevin says I think Long Meg fit, uh, Long Meg fits this perfectly, especially as they carved her. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Um, it's it's an interesting question though, of whether they carved her in situ or whether she was already carved elsewhere and then brought in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I favour that one to be honest, but um, yeah. we don't. I think know. a lot of that went on. We think. Yeah, anyway, I've Joe moved Glacier, on. I've... Longshore Drift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so many possibilities on there. Yeah. I've clicked the button and we've moved on Jimmy. to Jimmy's question. Uh, who was involved in the saving of nine ladies? All hail, we're, Jimmy. We're talking about the nine ladies of Stanton Moor, isn't Stanton it? Stanton Moor. Mm. Up in Derbyshire. Um, perhaps you'd like to say more about uh, that, uh, Jamie, it was a, a cause celebre saving uh, the nine yeah. ladies from, uh, was it gravel? Yeah, it was. Uh, it, uh, gravel um, pits and stuff. Yeah. Was it gravel? I can't actually remember. I mean, it's on an upland, yeah. so uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, could have been all sorts. But um, have a, uh, it's an question, interesting... But However, the on. question is, are there any megalithic sites currently under threat? Is there anything for young people to get behind saving right now? Um, mm, uh, can, can I can I turn that on its head? Yeah, do. Um, because I, I actually don't think that the issue is whether there are any sites to be saved right now. I can't think of any, to be honest, offhand, because there is a, a there's a much greater interest in maintaining our heritage now, apart from HS2 ripping up old woodlands. But yeah. uh, I, I see what I think is important in this issue is. We should get young people interested in their local archaeology so that they actually get to know and uh, and love their local sites in the same way as they might love their local playground. And then if anything does crop up where a development uh, company is going to come in and try to do something, that they will already have an interest in looking after their own local sites. You know, yeah. I think that we should be engaging children in prehistory a lot more actively than we do anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're hearing stories, of course, of vandalism of all sorts and defacing of uh, uh, of uh, of, um, mm. of rock art and, and things like that. I mean, interestingly, of course, pertinent. We were talking about the Cocknow Stone uh, over the weekend, <laughs> and vandalized course, by an archaeologist. Yeah, vandalized by an archaeologist. <laughs> shouldn't laugh you know but i mean if you want the whole <laughs> the whole story is there um uh, yeah it's quite uh, shocking uh, yeah uh, go check out uh, kenny brophy's site uh, the urban uh, urban prehistorian for the story and of course our interview with him about the story of the cochno stone which you don't if you don't know seek it out it's fascinating but that's not what the question was about are there sites i suppose in a sense that are always sites and it depends what level you're talking about. The fact that we have got the number of sites left in the British Isles that we have, 
uh, is, uh, well, those are the ones that haven't been dragged away for uh, farm walls. And, um, you yes. know, it's not that <laughs> long ago uh, mm. that stuff was regularly being destroyed uh, under the plough. And, mm. you know, and, and that still needs to be protected because if you're a farm farmer with uh, the odd stone on your land, mm. it's a toss up unless it's under protection of some sort. That said, one yeah, thing, I, one place does spring to mind, and that's Thornborough Henges. They are under, mm. you know, in the same way that um, um, the Nine Ladies, I think. I don't think there's much going on there at the moment. But the, though, if it wasn't for people being up in arms about uh, it happening, the gravel companies uh, would have um, put paid to Thornborough Henges for the most part. I'm afraid to say, but they're still there. Yes. Can we uh, can we just uh, catch up on a couple of these comments here? Please, I didn't know, yeah. Martin. Uh, well, Martin said uh, that he's made a video on uh, the Cochno Stone. If anybody's mm -hmm. interested, yeah, yes, Martin, yes. you make lovely films. So uh, yeah, folks, if you don't know, uh, Martin is before Caledonia. Go to his uh, YouTube channel and have a look at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, uh, I'm sure I saw something else up there. Yeah, what are the thoughts on the return of the time team? Yeah, all good. We're all good about that. We're all good about that. I'm not going to digress into that, though. Um, well, I'm sure I saw something. Oh, it was uh, Martin, 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 wasn't it? Yeah, Martin said Stanton Moore is gritstone quarries. Gritstone so, quarries, yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yes. Uh, well, as he says, Thornborough Henges is Yorkshire. I'm going to call you Yorkshireman, Yorkshireman Martin, I think. <laughs> We've got Yorkshireman Martin and... Uh, and uh, where, Martin, before Caledonia, Martin, where are you from, Martin, in Scotland? Um, <laughs> yeah, which bit? Um, um, anyway. Anyway, Lazzie, Matt, uh, Thornborough Henges under threat, question mark. How can that be seen as reasonable? Well, it's it's not. Um, mm. uh, and I don't know what the present state of quo is, uh, to be absolutely fair. But it did, you know, it needed people to hear, uh, have their voices heard for uh, um, the gravel, the owners of the land. They own the land. The gravel companies own the land upon which uh, Thornborough Henges uh, stand. So from their point of view, it's um, um, perfectly reasonable to exploit their asset. Um, that's their reasoning. Uh, and the you other know, side of... Go on, Rupert. Sorry, I just... I know that this is going to be contentious for a lot of people, but I think that we have a very distorted view of prehistory. You know, OK, there are sites that do need to be kept... But, you know, at what expense to uh, to modern life? So, for example, you know, the biggest hot potato these days is the Stonehenge Tunnel, uh, where, OK, you've got people, and, and I'm not picking sides here, I'm just deliberately playing devil's advocate, that you've got people who don't want it uh, dug, and you've got people who do want it dug, and, and the argument is that, but digging the tunnel is going to destroy the archaeology. Now, the thing about that is that uh, regardless of the fact that actually the bulk of the archaeology has already been done, the thing is that, well, okay, but what, what, you're, what you're actually suggesting is that we just leave it alone and the archaeology stays in the ground forever. Because if you're saying don't dig it, don't dig it, it's never going to be excavated because of the land that it's on, right by the side of the road or what have you. Uh, so what you're saying is, don't do anything with it, and therefore we can't learn anything from it. Uh, and so when when archaeology arises because of development, they're building a new housing estate and something gets found, we learn so much from things happening in development. Um, so I, I don't think we should have this blanket attitude that prehistory should be held as completely sacred and uh, and never messed with. I do think there are contexts in which we actually learn more from accepting that uh, that something needs to change. Mm. Uh, yes, there are sites like Thornborough. No, Thornborough absolutely is, you know, it's unique in Britain and, oh, and, uh, and therefore should be the protected. Uh, you, you would just end up with a hole in the ground. Uh, you know, so there are, so, there are some things where, no, there is uh, there is nothing to be gained 
other than a few quid in somebody's pocket, uh, there's nothing to be gained from its destruction. But I don't think that's always mm-hmm. the case. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'd be interested, I must do you know, more research on what the present status quo is vis-a-vis uh, Thorn- Thornborough Henges. To be honest, I don't know, uh, except there is this delicate balance between uh, the owners of, of the land upon which they stand, who are the gravel um, uh, companies, and, of course, the local people. They don't actually want people coming there. They don't want a vast visitor centre. You know, people uh, turning up, clogging their narrow roads up there. I felt a bit guilty, you know, doing my little video about the uh, the Northern Henge in the in the in the forests there, in in the woods mm-hmm. there. Um, uh, you know, it's so, it's one of those sites here. It's, it's fascinating, but you don't want to draw too much attention to it because mm-hmm. mm, all all get ruined. Mm. Uh, mm. Eh, anyway. It's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a huge conversation, and of course, it feeds into the whole conversation about how much restoration do you do? There isn't a site, you know, a, a, a reasonable site in in the whole of the country that hasn't been restored to some uh, degree. If if no if nobody had propped a stone up, there'd be nothing nothing to see at all. Mm-hmm. That people hadn't yeah. taken care, you know, uh, our ant- mm. antiqui- mostly, you know, our Victorian antiquarians. We've got a lot mm. to, you know, we owe them a lot in terms of what's visually left in the in the landscape. Yeah. At least places Do like you know, what? I think a very stones. good point. Mm. That's true. I, I think another very good point, and I've probably mentioned this before uh, along the line, not tonight, but. Oh, um, Lassie, it's, you... it's right up to the it's right up to the hinges. The the um, the the, uh, the 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 quarrying activity is all around. If you if you just look on mm. the map, you'll see all those lakes and stuff, which are very nice nature reserves. Don't get me wrong, mm. um, but they're right up close to uh, the vicinity of the hinge. Sorry, anyway, sorry, Rupert. No, it's all right. Yeah, they are. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to say, if uh, if you still have a local library. Uh, of uh, of any merit, uh, then ask if you can see their maps. Um, because if you go to a map room and go to their historic maps, many of the libraries have maps going back centuries. And just have a look at them and look at the sites that are all over the maps, that many of them called Giant's Graves and a surprising amount called Grey Weathers. You know, we, 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 we you know... We know about grey weathers on Dartmoor, and we think, well, that's the only one. And we know about all the giants' grave there. There were hundreds of them because they didn't know what they were. They called them giants' graves. Uh, Um, But the thing is, you look at the old maps, and they're covered in sites that aren't there anymore. And uh, and so, you know, we have a luxury today because, you know, you look how much um, our civilization has changed in the last 200 years. We're not farming folk, you know. We're not people who tend, generally speaking, who tend to live on the land, and uh, and so we we look at uh, at our ancient sites as as being so important because we have that luxury, you know. If if you were a farmer who just had these bloody great lumps of stone stopping him from uh, using his land properly, you know, you can. You can see it from all sides. Uh, it's just all I'm saying is, you know, you look at how much has been lost uh, when you when you see old maps. It's astounding, just astounding what's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, let's be careful out there. Let's um, yeah keep keep watching. <laughs> yeah. Keep what? No, I was going to say keep yeah. watching the skies. That would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, should we move on? This mm. is the last question of the evening, folks. Gosh, we're still going. Look, to uh, end, anyway, uh, uh, Alex, Alexander, Alexander. I <laughs> uh, hope you're there, <laughs> uh, Alex. Um, Alex, uh, maybe a long question. We'll see. It's getting on for uh, 10 o'clock. Um, but I want <laughs> to study archaeology in uni, and I'm going to Dartmoor in the summer. What are the best places there for a beginner to visit. It's, uh, 
Over to you, mm. Mr. Soskin. You know, you are <laughs> oh, really? really? Uh, okay. um, well, you're our resident uh, Dartmoor expert. You, you, you've uh, trod the Well, do you know what? Is it, we, we should have got Leon, really. Um, yeah. It's a shame, Alex, that you didn't say where on Dartmoor you um because it's a big place, 365 square miles. <laughs> um, so favourite sites, well... God, there well, are so many. Question of favourite sites. I mean, what I'm curious about is what Alex wants to get from a visit to Dartmoor. If you know, he's pr he's, he's uh, sort of prefaced <laughs> this by saying well, he's, he wants to study archaeology. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, it, but if it's just something that's going to f put fire in his bones or his veins, um, then I, I think number one, you've got to go to Merivale because. There you see all aspects of uh, of a society in a single place, really. Um, so you know, you you could spend an entire day just wandering around the stone rows, the stone circles, the hut circles. Oh God, it's just bliss. Um, so much there. I think from the if you're prepared to do a serious bit of walking. Then one of the, uh, for me, one of my absolute favourite areas for really giving you a big cross section of different types of existence going on, and uh, that close to there's the parking at the bottom uh, near Drizzlecombe. Gutter tour. It's not gutter tour. Thank you. Um, so from gutter tour, you can walk up. Uh, towards the uh, the Drizzlecombe Stone Rose, and you go across, You unless you're looking for it, you just think you're walking across rubble, but you're walking across a massive settlement. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then if you spend some time walking, you know, it, you can go, uh, you know, a, a, a couple of miles in, in all directions, and you get different types of burial, different types of can. You can walk over to Yellow Mead, which is the quadruple stone circle. It's the remains of a massive, massive burial can. Uh, then, oh, God, there's... In that particular couple of square miles, there's so much stuff there. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, though. I mean, like I say, Alec is, Alex is talking about doing archaeology. And mm. uh, a walk, you know, or visiting any one of these places is a wonderful thing. But you're not exposing yourself to um, actual archaeology because you're, you, you, what you're seeing in these places <laughs> is as much as anybody else has done. There, there, there isn't that much archaeology uh, on Dartmoor that's, a, that's apparent that really, you know, uh, speaks to the, the science and uh, you know, what can be learnt. We've got a few dates here and there, but the then the Merivale's stone rows, nobody knows, the, the dates are insecure about those. You know, there is no yeah. real archaeology about them. There are very, very few uh, actual remains that can tell you what was really going on, you know, uh, that the, the can be carbon dated, all that kind of things. From an archaeological point of view, the interesting places are Sitterford Stone Circle, where stuff is going on right now, because uh, the Sitterford Stone Circle, the, the stones were pushed over, and so any uh, dating and all the... <clears throat> Uh, uh, zoological remains and uh, the uh, uh, um, the makeup of the landscape has been um, preserved underneath those stones, and also further up uh, up past Greyweathers, we're talking about here. There's Cut Hill Stone Row, which is not a vast stone row, but again, these stones fell over. Um, quite early on in it seems quite early on in their existence and the preserved peaks from way 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 back 
and the results from these places are actually pushing the uh, dating of uh, megalithic monuments on on Dartmoor back quite a bit. However, all that said, if you really want uh, the only really exciting, wonderful bit of archaeology that's come out of Dartmoor recently, um, I can't remember which uh, year it was uh, in. Um, I think it's seven or eight years years ago, but the Bronze Age burial. Yeah, River. that uh, Lee got all the. Um, yeah. uh, that's what I'm actually looking for now because. Um, um, I mean, there's nothing to see. Was it, was it, Ham was it Hamble Down? Uh, Do you know what? I'll, um, I'll actually. Um, uh, I'll answer this question in a completely White Horse different Hill. way. Is uh, it near Whitehorse Hill? Well done. That's the one. Well, yeah. That is the one. Well yeah, done. Yeah. Well done. They actually, um, they got, uh, it, it's actually turned out to be an internationally important burial yeah. at Whitehorse Hill. Um, I was going to say, uh, actually, if you're, um, uh, if you're serious, uh, uh, message me uh, wherever, message me directly, um, Oh, I'm talking another. to Alex. Yeah, I'm talking to Alex. Yeah, um, because I'll put you in touch with Lee Bray, yeah, who is the yeah. head archaeologist on Dartmoor. Yeah, um, because Lee um, Lee is out on the more. That's what he does. This is his job, um, and uh, and I'm sure that he happily sees people. You know, off and on, and I'm sure he'd be happy. You know, you could meet up with him, and you'd have a—he's a lovely bloke. You'd have a, a great day out with uh, with him, mm -hmm. and he could really yeah. give you some pointers. You know, you could go and—I don't know where you live, but you could go and study um, archaeology at Exeter. Um, there, I tell you, there, there's some cracking archaeology goes on uh, at Exeter. There's. Uh, uh, you know, there's been some seriously good people coming out of there. Bruce Bradley, uh, who's a, a bit of a hero of ours, Bruce Bradley was uh, oh, yeah, a lecturer yeah. at uh, he Exeter was, University yeah. for a long time before he went back to the States. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, do that. Um, get in touch with me and I'll, I'll put you in touch with Lee Bray. Well, we must say hello to Indigo L. We've never said hello to Indigo L before. And uh, she seems to be, I, I don't know, are you a she? Sort of presuming so. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Uh, oh my God! Caught you at last. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, yeah, you're lucky we're still here. It's been a long <laughs> evening, but with absolutely yeah, fantastic lovely. that you made it. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and hello, hello to you. <laughs> Very glad you're here. Uh, I'm afraid we won't be going on for very much longer. But um, uh, yeah, or um, also, Alex, yeah. um, if you search down not too far down in the uh, on the channel, uh, you'll find our interview with Lee Bray, and uh, that's uh, hugely illuminating about uh, and uh, yes. uh, Dartmoor. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, take a listen to that. If that doesn't inspire you further, and uh, um, then I, I, nothing will. I mean, Lee was absolutely tremendous uh, talk, talking mm. to him. Um, do, do you know what, Rupert? <laughs> we should do a thing about uh, the burial at, uh, at White Horse Hill. White Horse Hill, we should. We should. Well, it, well, it uh... is hugely important, and I don't think that many people know about it. Uh, it's so uh, enigmatic. You know, it's a, a burial, a 4,000 year old uh, burial of a, of a young woman uh, out on the moors. I mean, it yes. wouldn't have been out on the moors then, but. It, uh, one presumes in a bear skin um, in a bear skin yeah yeah with uh, uh, Hello, Rhonda. uh beads and ear studs and all that kind of uh thing yeah uh, I mean, yeah that's but yeah whole, you want to look out to sorry i was just gonna say look out the um uh the interview because we did ask lee uh lee bray about that and he told us some funny stories um uh, about that particular <laughs> That yes. particular excavation. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to yeah. not going to give you any spoilers on that. It's just very funny. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the the thing about any of those places, I would. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff we'd like to do on Dartmoor, um, but I'd rather do that with some location filming, wouldn't you, Mike? Rather than doing it from the, uh, you know, yeah, the, the studio comfort. There's so many. 
places to show down there. But yeah, Whitehorse Hill would be a cracker. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, 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 we're getting serious about getting out filming again, you know. Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, I have to show the folk this. I mean, just to prove that we're getting serious about going out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Behold, it's amazing. It's behold amazing how the, small. Behold how small you can Stone's do cinema camera, quality folks. film these days. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with that. Have we rubbed two quartz pebbles together? Um, be more specific, David. There are some quartzes that you can uh, you can get internal sparks off. Yeah. Um, is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Gone all quiet, all quiet and wistful thinking about that. I was actually trying to remember where mine are. In what film. your quartz stones? Are you going to do it now? Yeah. Turn your lights off and uh, no, I'm not. I'd have to do, do that. It's a milky quartz. It's a milky quartz, and when you ah. when you grind them hard together, they yeah. actually fluoresce internally. And uh, yeah, so you couldn't yeah. make fire with them, but it, they just glow inside. It's nice. I don't know if that's what David's talking about. But, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a it's a anyway. black magic um, uh, cinema camera 4K um, Martin in a um, um, in a cage in a and, uh, and all <laughs> stuff, and uh, yeah, mm. I like. Uh, I feel like hey, I just uh, don't quite like my gear. I think it's time to say goodbye. <laughs> Anthony was here as well. Hello, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> so you were hiding there. I, I would. What do you think you're doing? I would, Anthony. What do you think? That means he's yeah. here and not making another film or I know. I playing know. in his brass band. <laughs> he's clearly having a night off. Yeah. <laughs> cool. You're well, yes. Um, th uh, thank you eternally, folks, for joining us. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks yeah. for the questions. You've certainly stirred the uh, uh, depths of our brains tonight. Uh, so thank you for helping us illuminate <laughs> Everybody else thank you, Joe, and Joe. ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and thanks for folk that have been sort of trying to bump the numbers up uh, by giving us likes. Uh, I think Lazzie was do doing that and encouraging people, and it really does help. YouTube notices, you know. So uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah it all, does help if you hit the like, if you hit that like. It it does make a difference to us. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you folks yeah. um, and uh, we'll see you the next time and um we will yeah, uh, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll be speaking to a lot of you on patreon up in the next few days uh, but, yeah. yeah yeah uh much to be uh, much to be uh, we have loads to do <laughs> and we'll yes, we do. jolly well get on with it and uh, report back <laughs> the next time all right all right I'm take care folks bye see you next time